So as a part of the Reconstruct Challenge, there was a group of community members and experts that got together and created a problem statement. They evaluated the applications and they chose tonight's pres presenters and they look forward to not only working with these innovators to make sure their palette gets off the ground, but just as well as being able to close the healthcare access equity gap. And so making sure that there's nothing that's gonna do no harm, help the community and just overall lessen that issue. And so tonight we would like to thank the Health Equity Innovation Hub, which has brought this group together. And here to talk about that is the acting director, Ben Reno Weber. Let's give it up. Didn't even make fun of how tall I am this time. I, body positive, that's right. Thank you so much, Mahogany. Um, thank you all so much for being here. We are incredibly excited to welcome this group of innovators who are coming from all over our country and from our own backyard. Uh, as well as the people who have been able to bring them together for this Reconstruct Challenge. This is our third, I guess, third through fifth Reconstruct Challenge. And the premise of the Reconstruct Challenge is that we deeply engage with community from the outset, as Mahogany highlighted, and you will hear every single one of us who talks about this highlight, to not only create the problem, but be part of crafting and benefiting from the solution. I said this is the, the third one uh, because this started uh, with two initiatives, first around workforce development and second around housing run by Access Ventures and our amazing partners with Render Capital. Uh, uh, Render, can you take a, a, we take a second to recognize Render Capital's amazing work in bringing innovations to our community? The, the problem that we are here to talk about tonight is the problem of medical access. Uh, and in Louisville, almost 16% of residents live in poverty, and that is particularly concentrated in certain geographies in our community. And in those geographies, the barriers of transportation to getting access to needed medical care and food, um, and as you heard, maternal and child support, uh, are significant. So what we were excited about working on tonight is hearing from tonight some innovators who have really come up with solutions for bringing that access to the to the med needed medical care into those homes. Uh, the way this works is first community input, uh, second then application and uh, selection culminating in tonight and then after that we will take those innovations into the field. This fits very much into a model that can be turnkey leveraged to solve almost any problem. Uh, the key piece for us, however, is working deeply in community to solve those problems, but combining that with the people and organizations that need to be involved in being sure that those community voices get access to the markets that they need to grow and scale, the purchasers that normally they don't, uh, the best wisdom of academia to help be sure that what we are doing is national best practice and also leveraging the academic protections on research to be sure that as we are doing this, we do no harm. Uh, and then we also bring together uh, entrepreneurs and innovators who can wrap sustainable financial models around that. So that fits very much into the overall work of the Health Equity Innovation Hub. We have met innovators, entrepreneurs, and community members where they are and help them get the access to the resources that they need to grow and scale their ideas. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize some of the folks from the hub who are here tonight. Uh, the Executive Vice President for Research and Innovation, did I get that right? Kevin Garner with the University of Louisville. Uh, our phenomenal Director of Research, Gabrielle Gassaway. Uh, and the program manager for Reconstruct Challenge, without whom none of the things that needed to happen for this evening or the previous two evenings would have happened, Ab Gab Abigail Cheek. I can't even say her name, so thank you so much. Um, why is this approach so It's important because in the normal run of things, if you are an innovator who has the from, from your lived experience or otherwise, but particularly from your lived experience, and you don't know someone personally who can get you access to purchasers in Humana, in the hospital systems, it's almost impossible for you to get that access. On the flip side, though we often don't think about this in the justice space, those 
organizations don't have permission space to fail. Right? We do not create space for them to try something that doesn't work without them losing their jobs. And so part of what we do is create that safe space on every side. Uh, and then because we have worked with community from the beginning, we get unique and unusual insights that most of those institutions can't get otherwise. Running this with multiple pilots at the same time enables us to really test and learn and build a cohort of people who can learn with each other. Um, and then because we have trusted relationships in the community, we can really help accelerate that learning and growth by leveraging those trusted relationships, also protecting against the harm that can happen when people come into a new space. So Louisville is particularly interesting as a learning lab for this because, uh, funny fact, Louisville is one of the two most representative cities of America in America. So anything that we prove here using Louisville as a learning lab, we can immediately take all across the country. We also are a hop, skip, and a jump from rural areas that face many of the same problems with slightly different complexion. Uh, and I want to take a moment to thank, uh, I just see he just made it here, uh, the Secretary for the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, Eric Freelander, um, who has been an unflinching ally to addressing the issues of equity across our state and leveraging the levers of power that he has. If you guys don't think elections matter, they matter. Um, and Eric is evidence of that. So he was part of the impetus for this in the first place. Uh, so I talked about how we do this. We craft the problem statement, getting the engagement of all of those four audiences, community members, academics, entrepreneurs, and industry. Then we issued a national call for innovations. We had more than 100 applicants for the 15 awards that we had. So congratulations to our innovators. Um, truly phenomenal. And they really are coming from all over the country. Then we engaged those same groups to assess the opportunities. Um, and now we are here to make them successful. Um, and part of making them successful is, is building a community that is open to innovation and willing to invest in itself. Uh, and I'm really honored tonight to uh, invite to the stage our Innovator-in-Chief, Mayor Craig Greenberg. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Ben, and it's great to be with you all here this morning, this evening, and it was, it's been wonderful to meet so many of you uh, in the past half an hour. My, my wife Rachel and I are thrilled to be here tonight, and really just the conversations that we've had over the past half an hour are truly inspirational. That was the word that came to my mind before I saw it happen to be on the banner. And that banner is 100% correct. Because hearing what you all are doing uh, with the startups and the companies that you all have innovated with and that are leading is truly, are truly solving some of the biggest challenges that we face as a city, as a country. When you think about our public health challenges that we have, our public safety challenges that we're all dealing with, to hear the solutions that you all are working on for things like maternal health, food justice, medical transport, healthcare access, period, these things are critical. And doing things the same old way clearly is not the solution to make our cities and countries safer, stronger, and healthier. And doing what you all are doing is absolutely part of the solution. I mean, it is the real world right now. My colleague Katie who's here tonight from our administration. We are dealing with issues in our city right now about medical transport because we believe that the state is going to change the laws on how it is operated in cities like Kentucky. So tonight is literally a perfect night in a perfect city to hear about solutions that are being innovated to solve real world problems so that more people can have access to health care and even more important, not as importantly as access, quality health care as well, regardless of where you live, regardless of the circumstances of life or what you were born into. And so that is something our administration is very focused on. We want to partner with innovators like you all. So thank you all for participating, for coming to Louisville. Congratulations to the winners. I look forward to learning so much more and hope we have an opportunity to partner in the near future. And Ben, thanks for everything that you were doing in both your private sector life, in your public life. Public servants like you are truly making amazing difference. And so thank you for inviting me here tonight and congratulations. Thank you again so much, Mayor Greenberg.
Well, I'm so excited to get started with our presentations this evening. I would like to first introduce our first presenter, Aaron Brown with Care Mobile. Let's give it up. Thank you all so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's very exciting to be in a room full of people with different backgrounds going towards, oh, excuse me, all working towards a common goal, increasing access to care. That's huge for us. Uh, there are numerous communities around Kentucky, uh, other states, other nations that need our help. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're reimagining dentistry. So one of the major hurdles for a lot of our patients is just getting to providers. Even in Louisville, if you were to draw a line where 65 is, there's maybe five providers on the west side. There's about 50 on the opposite side. A lot of the people that live on the opposite side can't get over there to them. That's where we come into place. So we are a company that offers comprehensive dental care, but we have mobile units. So similar to the Amazon Sprinter van, it's a single unit dental chair. And we can do everything from fillings, root canals, extractions, even to cosmetic concerns. Um, as the slide mentions, there's rural populations that struggle to get, get to places, African Americans as well even transportation, and this is for people that have cars, you know, 15 minutes, decreased the amount of time that they can get to an office. I see a lot of patients routinely that don't even have cars that have to walk. So us being able to bring several vans into their community is a game changer for them. And that's either downtown Louisville, nursing homes, rural areas, wherever that may be. So our company started in 2017 when Dr. Watson, our CEO, noticed that occasionally he would have no-shows, just like any other dental office. So he developed an app that patients could use if they have an emergency. They can get on the app and say, hey, I need treatment. Get on there, and Dr. Brown has it up opening at 12 o'clock and see him. Then he pivoted and said, you know what, why don't I start going to see these patients? So he converted a food truck into a mobile dental unit, and then here we are now, just like cell phones. Every year it gets a little bit better. It gets a little bit more innovative, more ergonomic, things like that. So we're constantly pushing and developing and introducing new equipment, new techniques, new training, because as the mayor said, quality care is very important to us, and that's something that all of our providers and team members strive to do. So this is an example of one of our vans, which I was on this morning, along with one of our hygienists. Um, so we have a couple of different models. We partner with brick and traditional offices. That way, if we go out to a rural community that's hours away, we do plan on getting back to them in continuity of care, but we also like having partners in those communities as well. So we have some brick and mortar hybrid models. We also have multiple mobile units that are all over the place. Just this last week, we had team members in Kentucky, uh, in Louisville, in Madisonville, in Chicago, in Vegas, all over the nation. So this model is definitely scalable, it's sustainable, and it's part of the future of dentistry. Uh, you can run each van just like a single unit operatory in a dental office, or you can have four or five. It just varies on whatever the need is. Sometimes I'm at a nursing home that only needs one. Sometimes I'm at a larger facility or community area that need significantly higher, higher amounts of care. All right, this is some of our team members. Uh, Dr. Nadaka is actually here with me, and uh, Stacy Lynn, one of our hygienists. But what we're about is helping the community. And I grew up here in the West End, uh, so I love that our company is doing something to meet the needs of the people in our community. So uh, I plan on being here for decades, so uh, I'm excited about it. But one of the problems is that we have two dental schools in, the, in Kentucky, in the state. It doesn't really make sense that we still have so many dental deserts in the same state. And nothing's wrong with the dentist, but a lot of times some dentists aren't willing to come to these specific areas. So what CARE is trying to do is bridge that gap to make it to where they are willing and can go, and also the patients benefit from that. So uh, that's what we're here for. We're eager for every opportunity to learn so we can go back to these communities and lead. So thank you all for your time. All right, thank you so much, Care Mobile. All right, I would like to go ahead and introduce our next presenter. We have Mika Eddy with Malama Healthcare. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. 
I'm the founder of Malama Health. My name is Mika Eddy, and we are improving pregnancy-related outcomes with a 24-7 evidence-based digital coach. My journey started, my journey with Malama, started with a diagnosis. Gestational diabetes at 28 weeks. Gestational diabetes is a quote-unquote temporary hyperglycemia experience during pregnancy. And I ended up being induced, gave birth to a healthy baby boy who just turned three and is at the back of the room today. So my story is a good one. And yet, we know that too many women do not have the same outcome. High-risk conditions like gestational diabetes also disproportionately affect historically underserved groups. One in three Medicaid women will be diagnosed with some form of diabetes in pregnancy, leading to an increased risk of needing an emergency C-section and of being admitted to the NICU. What that means is 40% C-section rate, 30 and 15% NICU admissions rate. And diabetes in communities are exploding with a 30% increase in rates between 2016 to 2020 and disproportionately affecting women of color with an 80% increase in black American patient populations. Also, I mentioned gestational diabetes is a quote-unquote temporary hyperglycemia, and yet the effects are not short-term. In fact, 70% of women will go on to develop type 2 diabetes, and a recent study published in JAMA just last week found an association of gestational diabetes with subsequent long-term risk of total and cardiovascular mortality. And yet, change and some hope is on the horizon. The prenatal pregnancy experience is changing rapidly. Data-driven platforms will shift the patient journey out of the hospital and into the home, and Malama is leveraging recent technology, FDA-cleared continuous monitoring, as well as remote access, as well as digital coaching, in order to make that transition happen. Our three-part system is live with nearly 4,000 women and in over eight health systems today. How does it work? And is it working? First, we've seen that we've been able to reduce C-section rates by about 50% in the nearly, in the over 3,500 women served and bring down NICU admissions rates by 38%. This translates to cost savings with over 6,000 in cost savings per pregnancy. To give you a sense of how it works, meet Anna, our composite character, a 30-year-old Latinx Humana member who was diagnosed with gestational diabetes at 26 weeks gestation. Anna's nurse recommends that she download Malama following her glucose tolerance test so that she can use the app to track her sugars and meal data. The app is available in multiple languages. Ana uses it in Spanish. Previous to Malama, she would have been instructed to start logging using pen and paper, missing the opportunity to leverage this data for risk stratification and care postpartum. Next, Ana leverages Malama's digital coach to get her levels under control. The platform is highly engaging with the average user logging 3.3 times per day and 80% of our patients achieving glycemic control in an average of two weeks. Anna's nurse asynchronously accesses the logs, allowing more time for counseling each visit, as opposed to asking what she ate for breakfast, what she ate for lunch, and what her glucose levels look like. Finally, Anna vaginally delivered her healthy seven pound, three ounce baby girl who was not admitted to the NICU and Anna is now breastfeeding her baby. And on the bottom of the slide, you can see some of the data from Malama's patients through patient reported outcomes. And in addition to a high member, high patient and provider satisfaction, Malama also helps with care navigation, offering complementary offerings. So far, we've been able to connect women on Medi-Cal, Medicaid in California, to medically tailored meals. We also offer in-app screening for mental health. And postpartum, we're also developing out a diabetes prevention program to prevent progression to type 2. Our team brings the best of healthcare and technology and consumer. 
My background is at United Healthcare and Optum. Our CTO comes from Airbnb, where he led experiences. Our chief experience officer was at L'Oreal and previously ran her own company, empowering Colombian artisans. And our clinical team includes Stanford's Director of Diabetes and Pregnancy Center. So far, we have executed agreements for 960,000 annual recurring revenue. And for providers, we don't charge an upfront fee while also enabling net new revenue generation through remote, remote patient monitoring with existing CPT codes. And for payers, we're targeting an over 7x ROI due to reduction in adverse outcomes. We're fortunate to be backed by a number of leading institutional and angel investors and are in clinical validation with study results coming out from Tufts later this year. Malama means to nurture, take care of, and we thank you for your support. We're so excited to get started with University of Louisville, and we welcome you to take part in helping to nurture and expand access to care for more women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malama Health. I would like to introduce Waleed Behuth with Kindly. Thank you very much. This is a very orange microphone. Hi, everybody. Molly Behuth, uh, co founder and CEO of Kindly Benefits, where we're hacking health insurance. We help people navigate the confusing health insurance marketplace by finding the best plan, tapping federal government money to make it affordable, and getting them covered. So, this are, the problem that we're solving in terms of access to affordable health insurance is personal to me. Uh, a few years ago, I was working at Humana running commercial strategy uh, for the health insurance business, and my wife built a nonprofit organization here locally that was growing. She needed to start offering health insurance to her employees to attract talent, and she said, can you help me with that? And in my hubris, I said, yes, of course I can. And, uh, and then the next day, um, I called Eric, my good friend who ran benefits at the time, and one of the foremost most benefits experts in the country, and said, I'm sorry, I'm screwed. I can't find anything that works for Jeanette. <laughs> Can you help me figure this out? Uh, and he talked to me about the individual health insurance marketplace and, and the opportunity there to both tap into federal government dollars or employer dollars and the growth there. And that got us on a trajectory of talking about this over a couple of years and really seeing the shift in, in the industry um, and the access gaps that were needing to be addressed right now. So we left our cushy jobs at Humana to start this company to really focus on access to affordable coverage, both for, for individuals and for small businesses. We brought along with us Susan Olson, who's uh, a well-known technology leader here locally, has built and run a few well-known uh, technology organizations, and Todd Zacharias, who was the uh, president of Humana's individual health insurance business, both pre and post Affordable Care Act, and then after that was SVP of Finance, for the commercial business. So we bring a lot of both industry and technical expertise to this problem. And really our area of focus is on the ACA marketplace. ACA stands for Affordable Care Act. Those are also known as the qualified health plans, the exchange plans, or the Obamacare plans. All in, they're basically the privatized individual health insurance marketplace. Um, that has grown exponentially, it doubled in size over the last few years, and we're really forecasting it to continue to grow significantly. And really, there are two reasons for that growth. One is the rising cost of employer coverage. Um, just like my wife's example, employer-sponsored coverage is just out of reach for many businesses now, especially small businesses. And then the federal subsidies offered to those ACA plans make them extremely affordable for most people. About 70% of Kentuckians will get a no cost or very, very low cost plan on the health insurance exchange um, if they can get to those plans. That's still the challenge though uh, across the country is navigating a very, very confusing individual health insurance marketplace. Agents are set up to help that and there are about 143,000 agents across the country but very, very few folks on individual business. Um, we're trying to help them do that, and we're trying to help people access those plans. So we've built a navigation tool called Kind Choice. We released uh, a soft launch of it this week, going big with a launch uh, next week or at the beginning of October. 
Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Milestone. We got to check that box and, and take a minute to appreciate that. Our initial area of focus is Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, and Tennessee. Uh, and really, the, the goal is to get people access to those plans in the fewest amount of steps as quickly as possible. So we source a few pieces of background information on them, ask them to answer a few basic questions around what they expect their utilization to be this year um, in plain language, simple, easy to understand, no health insurance jargon, in English and Spanish to start. And our matrix factorization algorithm tells them what the best plan is for them. So it kind of gives them an easy button into the, the best value type of plan with a couple of other options to consider as well. So we're trying to shortcut the process from application to enrollment down to five to seven minutes. Um, it's an, an acute area of focus for us right now is on Medicaid unwinding, which is the uh, post-COVID activity of reducing the Medicaid footprint. So during COVID, during the COVID period, Medicaid eligibility regulations were relaxed and Medicaid swelled about 30 million people. 20 to 25 million of those are forecasted to leave Medicaid because of funding cuts over the next 12 months. And many of those folks will be uninsured if they don't find another option. So we're extremely focused on this Medicaid population right now and helping them find the best option in the ACA marketplace. And we're using these reconstructs challenge dollars to partner with community organizations. I see Claire, SLCM in the front row, South Louisville Community Ministries, um, community organizations like that that can help us really take our reach out into the, the community, put these tools in uh, individuals and agents' hands so that they can navigate this, this confusing insurance marketplace. Uh, from there, we focus then on the, the open enrollment periods and then small to mid-sized employers, which again, the cost of group coverage is, is out of reach for many of them. This individual marketplace is a great solution for them. So we're building on to our, our kind choice for individuals application with a, with a business application next year. Um, the good news for consumers and for agents is there's no cost for them to use this. We make money through the, the insurers themselves, and then when we uh, work with businesses, we charge a, a nominal per member per month platform fee to use a platform. We've got relatively aggressive uh, goal, growth goals in mind that are informed in large part by payer partnerships that we've set up with some of the local managed care organizations uh, and other distribution partners. So really excited to be able to talk to, to you all about this. So encouraged by all the exciting um, access innovations that we're hearing about today. And thank you all very much for the time. Thank you so much. All right. Girl, hold on. All right, next up, I would like to invite Kenzie Butera Davis with Maro. Let's go. Sorry. Make sure I say your name. <laughs> First, I just want to start off by thanking everyone here for inviting me to your city. It is wonderful. Um, I flew in from Montana, but I'm originally from Tennessee and Mississippi, so very familiar with the landscape of the South, um, but had not been to Louisville. Uh, so really loving my time here. Um, my name is Kenzie Butera Davis. I'm the CEO and founder of MARO. Our focus is on early intervention and risk detection for youth mental and behavioral health. There have been a lot of really incredible emerging companies that we've seen pop up over the last decade that are addressing the youth mental health crisis. Most of these companies are teletherapy or telepsychiatry companies that sit at the point of care, so super, super needed, but they're only addressing a part of the problem. 50% of all mental illness begins before the age of 14, However, there's currently an average 11 year gap between the first time a child shows a symptom that they're struggling with their mental health to the first time that child receives any form of intervention. That is Children's Hospital Association data, not my own. So where Morrow focuses is on the preclinical side of the problem to address mental illness as close to onset as possible. 
Specifically, our mission is to eliminate the 11 year gap between first symptom and first intervention. So the way that we do that is we take a whole community model, which is one of the most incredible uh, ways that we align with the Reconstruct Challenge and their goals of inviting the whole community to participate in both uh, the problem identification and the solution. So the communities that we work with overlap school professionals, providers, and parents or guardians. Um, this produces a unique closed loop system, loop system that actually proactively identifies mental illness as close to onset as possible. There are three core functions of our overlapping system. The first is a data thoroughfare. We're sourcing data from many different sources across families, schools, and providers, um, and putting that in one you know, true north place. We're collecting digital consents and making sure families are engaged throughout the whole process. And then we're streamlining care coordination. So the way it works is we usually start with K-12 schools and districts. Um, just in the same way that schools have adopted physical health screenings, we're helping them expand to mental health screenings. So we've built a platform that's a lot like TurboTax. It makes it incredibly simple for schools to actually uh, screen kids for things like anxiety and depression and identify those symptoms and then triage interventions and care referrals so we get kids to care as soon as those symptoms are identified. We engage families and reduce friction along the way. One of the biggest challenges being collecting consents. You would not believe the amount of times that school professionals have told me they're chasing kids down the hall to grab them out of class because their parent called and they can't actually be screened. We don't want that. We want families to have rights and have autonomy. So we just do that through our app. It's really easy. You click a button and let us know if you want your child to be screened or not. Um, to accompany that, we have lots of educational resources. You can actually talk directly to a pediatrician if you have questions or concerns about your child being screened. You can track certain behaviors over time. Um, and so we really want to make sure we've created that ecosystem of support. And then finally, where do the providers fit into this model? This is where we are taking the data that we're collecting from Morrow for Schools and Morrow Families and making sure there's a seamless integration process with electronic medical records. That's the first application. Um, another application is population health, so really getting a sense for the overall health of your community. And then finally, because we are collecting the largest database of pediatric and adolescent mental and behavioral health data, our ultimate goal is to build predictive behavioral health models to identify mental illness at onset. Mental illness is costly. It's also largely preventable. So our goal is to shift the paradigm of spend completely on its head and turn a reactionary market into a proactive one. A little bit about our progress and traction. Because we sit at the intersection of schools and healthcare, we actually were number one ed tech startup in the world this year and leading pediatric health innovation from Oracle Cerner. And then finally, I just want to quickly share a bit about my team. They're incredible. They're using their talents across technology, uh, content creation, and uh, the clinic to build what we've built today. Um, but notably, I want to shout out my chief medical officer, Tarek Chaudhary, who is actually in Lexington as the chief quality and safety officer at UK. Please feel free to connect with me. We're looking for school leadership, K-12 parents, health system leadership, and seed stage investors. And I'd be more than happy to share about the work that we've done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I would like to invite our last presenter. We have Bob Mazur with Zenyo Healthcare. Well, I've been looking forward to this day for three years. Um, I want to say thank you to my family, all their support, uh, all the leaders that made this possible, all the, and the state for helping make it funded. So I'm here today to launch a new company. It's called Zenior Healthcare. We're goal, our goal is to upcycle technology, simplify it, and then 
help, help use it for care connections and care communications. I'm going to do a brief pandemic story for you, tell you about the market, introduce our solution, and then our journey forward. So my father had a stroke. He's OK, uh, but one of the drawbacks was he got something called aphasia, which means that <clears throat> he can't put a sentence together. His vocabulary is maybe 30 words. So he can't even say my name or Siri or Alexa or any of these AI tools to pick up his voice, nor would he remember to say, call Bob and, or Alexa, call Bob. And so my mom, she had dementia, and so she didn't remember what day it was. And so she wanted um, to, to always connect as well. And so when the pandemic happened, I provisioned a tablet here in Louisville, sent it up to Michigan, and I was able to manage their Zoom calls, their video calls, through uh, my connections here and uh, through the, the uh, remote connection. And so my dad, uh, when he was in the pandemic, he was on the porch, uh, and my sister and brother were down on the grass, and he was doing this motion with his hands. And my sister and my brother looked at each other and said, you know, what do you need? What do you want? Do you want pants? And my dad's like, yes. So um, when I provisioned the tablet, I sent it up there. And we were having a video call, and we are saying, Dad, how do you like those new pants? And he's like shaking his head. And we're like, what is it that you need? Go show us. And so uh, what he really needed was a garbage bag. His garbage bags were full. So it was from that experience that I realized that we had to simplify the care and communication um, for uh, older adults with cognitive impairments. And it, it's not just people who are over 65. According to the CDC, their disability measure, there's probably about 17% in the state of Kentucky. And while there's a lot of AI tools that are awesome and fantastic, there's a segment of the market that can't use them. And that's why I'm here today. Because there's people like my sister who are, provide care um, for my dad. And uh, by 2050, there's going to be a shortage of caregivers around the world to the tune of 14 million people. And the cost of Alzheimer's dementia in the, in the United States is $300 billion today. It's going to grow to $1.1 trillion in 2050. And so in the state of Kentucky, there's a nursing shortage. It was a state of emergency in 2021 and 2022. The uh, Surgeon General Advisory Board said there's going to be a 3 million person shortage, uh, which translates for healthcare workers, translates to about 6,000 people here in our area. And so, what I've developed is a simple way to upcycle, simplify, and create care communications. And there's a web app, and then there's the, the, the upcycle device, and you can toggle what you want to display on that remote device. If you have a reminder setting uh, that's programmed remotely, it's going to show up on the remote device for, let's say, my dad. Uh, it's time to take his blood pressure. You can personalize it and send your own photos. And that's where Zen Your came from. We're going to Zen. You could send Zen photos. Because when my mom had her dementia, we put up a picture of a bird for Monday or a waterfall for Tuesday. So we could associate a day with the Zen photo. And then for connections, instead of saying, mom or dad, go to your computer and get the, the credentials, uh, we send the Zoom link and information so it comes to my dad as a, like a phone call. And then lastly, we're talking to Holy Family Church here in Louisville, and they, have, they stream their mass, but their homebound parishioners can't get access to it because they don't have technological skills. So what we do is we, we're going to give them tablets to be able to stream uh, the mass to those homebound uh, parishioners. So that's sort of our, our, our new vision, is to use faith-based organizations as a bridge into people's homes. We will provide the software, and through drop-off boxes or upcycle events, the, the devices will come into the uh, place of worship. The youth of that organization or that place will help provision the tablets and deliver them so that they can have care communications, telehealth, and transportation if needed. And when they're done with it, it's returned to the pl place of worship and gets reused for another person. So it extends the life of that technology. 
And so I've been working for three years with an amazing group of people, uh, including uh, the University of Louisville. We have a research a researcher there. Uh, Bellarmine University has a researcher that's joined us, and Indiana University. So we're looking for corporate collaborators, uh, faith-based organizations, and investors. But there's one more thing. Uh, we're taking beta customers on Monday. So uh, at ZenyourHealthcare.com. Thank you. Um, so my mom was my inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zen Your Healthcare. Let's give one more round of applause for all of our pitches and presenters this evening. And again, so um, on behalf of Taylor Ryan, who could not be here and change today, change tomorrow, um, thank you guys for coming. I would like to turn it back over to Ben, who's going to close us out. Uh, so part of the magic of the Reconstruct Challenge uh, in the past and of the last couple of nights that we've done this is what happens next, which is that we uh, have a beverage, have some food, meet one another. Uh, if you heard something that inspired you or that you sparked an idea, this is the opportunity to go talk to those founders uh, and get to know them, then let them get to know you, share your ideas, let the magic happen from here. Uh, and we will be welcoming all of them back to be piloting here in Louisville over the next several months. So thank you all so much for being here, uh, and onward we move.